So in line with all of the uh, previous ideas around really needing to develop technologies and address issues around aging, um, mobility, but also across the lifespan, uh, the ideas keep coming up that we need to develop more specified needs. And it's not enough for people right now, just at people developers to create all these needs um, based off their own experience. We actually need to go to the user population and ask them what their thoughts are on this. Um, so in line with that, we brought together uh, a group of seniors from the community and top designers from IDEO to actually walk uh, a number of people through this design thinking process in order to actually develop user specified needs um, straight from the horse's mouth, if you will. So uh, basically what we did was um, have the IDEO uh, leaders give a talk on design thinking 101 um, and then break into groups and ideate around needs for different areas. So uh, we had participants from Stanford Emeriti, Avenidas, and the Bay Area community. So thank you everyone for participating, um, some of which are here today. And we're going to have a workshop panel uh, after this to actually talk a little bit more about that. Uh, thanks to IDEO as well for moderating this. Wonderful job getting ideas uh, from our participants. And so our specific goals were to generate areas of focus to actually give to designers. Um, so through the design thinking methodology, uh, people categorized ideas based on personal needs, home, and community. And then what we're going to do is actually uh, process all this data, a lot of which we've already done, and then make it useful um, and available to student designers so that they can actually have a repository to go to uh, of ideas that they can then use to inform their design subsequently. So I'm just going to give you a quick uh, summary of some of the top goal or top um, problem areas and target areas for each theme. So the first theme was staying active. Um, and so as you can see here, the top three themes that came up were available, availability and access. Um, so that's basically uh, availability to things in their environment that would help them to be more active. Um, also access, so a lot of times people would like to get their hands on some sort of design or solution, but that's not necessarily an option for a lot of different reasons. Um, so lack of comfort, um, this was uh, resonated around things like uh, ergonomics, exercise equipment not being useful, um, you know, people with mobility impairments, but also people that may have a nagging knee injury and so um, their treadmills hurt their knees. Uh, affordability, that's a big topic right now. Um, a lot of focus on designing for affordability um, in multiple areas. So that's something that we'd like our designers to keep in mind as they're uh, going about creating solutions for this year's challenge. And then for the community, um, some of the top areas were, um, so this idea of community is where I am uh, at that moment. So it's not necessarily this uh, sort of historical idea that we've had of just a physical space that one lives in, but it's really um, people move around, um, you know, their community can be multiple places. Uh, and so another idea that came up a lot was a uh, need for cu cultivating social networks with age um, and not just technologically like Facebook, Twitter, things like that, but physical environments. So we need to stress that, especially for our young designers, that um, this actual physical social network is something that's still very important and needs to be maintained and cultivated throughout the lifespan. Um, and then another idea was a lack of awareness for existing resources. Uh, so you can imagine multiple um, solutions around that, but basically harnessing what we already have available and making that more usable to people. And then the third uh, area was the home. And so 
Um, something that really resonated was the idea that psychological and or emotional um, are just as important as physical welfare. So a lot of times around mobility, we seem to focus on the physical sphere um, and physiology more so than uh, perceptions, psychological states, emotional states that accompany the physicality of um, certain situations. So uh, if people can really design for keeping that in mind, that would be very useful. Um, the idea of just one misstep is all that it takes. Uh, falls are a huge problem, as most of you know. Um, really, if somebody has one fall, they can be permanently disabled and um, multiple other negative outcomes. So really this idea of being cognizant at all times of preventing that one misstep um, and how you work around that because, uh, again, it's not an easy solution. If people are always staring at their feet, they don't get to enjoy life. One participant said, I never see the sun, moon, and stars because I'm always looking at my toes. So really thinking about issues like this. Um, and then lastly, uh, the idea that not all falls or accidents are emerged to require true emergency services. So right now, most of the infrastructure is set up such that uh, if there is an emergency, the ambulance is sent, the fire trucks are sent, um, you know, all out emergency situation. But um, uh, one of our caretakers brought up the point that if someone falls, you know, the need is not around all of that really alarming response to come, that we just need solutions to help a caretaker get the person back up onto their feet. So there's this real need for intermediary services. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Katie Fike and our panel. Um, our panel of speakers today um, are drawn largely from the workshop that we held last week here. And um, they'll give a brief introduction of their name, affiliation, and I think a couple ideas that they think are important around mobility, and then um, turn it over to the audience for discussion. Great. Thank you. Great. Ready? All right. I think these microphones are on. Perfect. All right, this is the first test in mobility. How accessible was our stage? <laughs> How'd we do? Thank you guys. Um, I want to just first let you guys know that, let's see, the first four of us were all together last week for the ideation, and then Kevin um, is here through our relationship with the Davis Finney Foundation, so he was not one of the participants, but I think is another great example of how can we learn from people what they really need and want in their lives. And I think that's really come up as a theme today, is you know, what do people really want? And one other thing that I took from Laura's talk is you know, we talk about compression of morbidity a lot. And I think today we're looking for design challenges that can compress mobility limitations. You know, how can we keep your mobility long, 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 and then at the very end maybe you're not quite so mobile. But um, how can we help you stay as mobile as possible? So what we wanted to start with was just have each of you introduce yourself. And then you know, it's been about a week since we did the design challenge. And I'm wondering, you know, after a week of it percolating and maybe looking at your daily life a little bit differently, what's one area that stands out for you as an important area for um, a need for innovation in round mobility. So name and need, please. Bob All Schwartz brought list. notes, I love it. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I thought that workshop was excellent, by the way, and I heard lots of good ideas. I did have a chance to think about it more since the workshop, and also talk to some of the people in the aging community that I'm in touch with. And um, I thought rather than um, maybe talking principles, um, that I could make my points by, by giving some specific examples of things that would be needed. Perfect. And I don't know if this is the right moment. Yep, so we'll each just spend just a minute or two on these, and then we can move the circle back around. OK, I need about I think we might need three or four, <laughs> that's OK. <clears throat> Let's hear your first two ideas. OK, so in no particular order, uh, one of the important things is that small tweaks to existing products can have enormous benefits. A lot of the products out there are just not quite right. And I have things in mind, for example, shoes and slippers around the house, uh, flooring materials, um, handrails that, that maybe should be made adjustable, uh, 
uh, and or um, things of that kind. Um, um, I have another good one here, and that is uh, things like walkers and canes should be um, should be made a little sexy. That is, they can they can be fashion statements, and people should be proud to show them off. And just to get as an example of things that could be done, and these are all small tweaks to existing products that could make a world of difference to people who use them. That's wonderful. And I, so I think that's a great design principle for the students is look at something that already exists and just make it a little bit better, whether it's something that's not for aging right now but needs to be tweaked for someone who might have some changes, or just make things more sexy. I, I think that's a good call, Paul. And if you all have not met Molly in the back, Molly is a fantastic example with boas on her wheelchair. And you know she's the only thing she said is original on there are the wheels and the motor. <laughs> and you know that ability, though, to tweak and personalize and make something work for you and make something feel like an expression of you, I think in mobility in particular, there's huge need for that. So we'll come back to more of your great ideas. But you can see why we need to tap into the wisdom of people who actually are cha challenging some of these things, because you have all these ideas. We just had to ask. Um, my name is Asmik Sarofi, and I've been in user-focused design for many, many years in high tech. And uh, I am amazed that this area is just being addressed uh, re recently. I'm quite amazed. Uh, I am at the opposite end. I'm going to go way up to, to 30,000 feet. And uh, the thought I had after last week was that we, um, there's a tendency to focus on hardware products. And there's a tremendous amount that can be done with this software. And my worry is that uh, what an 18-year-old can handle in software is not necessarily what an 80-year-old handles in software. So our experience is to address the younger user, but the, the, I think it's very important to also focus on how the older user, and one specific example I have there is older users will not be as visually uh, responsive as they would be to words. So we tend to use a lot of icons, a lot of things, you know. Uh, if you ask, uh, I have, this has happened to me, how will you turn it on, uh, on your device? They don't know what the symbol is for on and off, you know. And so it's better to have a word there that says on and off than, than to, to do the, the symbol. And that's just a small example of the larger challenge of a lot of this interaction is going to be on, the sc on some screen of some kind, mm -hmm. and there is a lot to be done with words. Please <laughs> use words. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Loud. to be louder? <clears throat> oh, I thought. Uh, yeah. I think we just kind of doing... make sure we're speaking into that. Oh, okay, okay. Um, that, that's sort of my one big thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can also, I was the one who, who was complaining that there was no way to lift somebody up without calling emergency. Uh, there are many, many hardware pieces that I can imagine. I was very intrigued by that chair uh, that, that you can sort of put together and sit in it. Something like that would be, uh, could be improved and become this thing that lifts you up. Uh, so there's tremendous room for hardware stuff too. So I yeah. think on the software side, this idea that we need to be doing user testing you know, early and often with older adults yes. and what we might think is intuitive to someone who grew up with an iPhone attached to their hand their whole life is really different than the first time you right. interact with the technology. Right. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about doing this iterative, especially with software, you can change it. You can test and try and see what works yes. best. Yes. And I think another thing to keep in mind is this caregiver perspective. So we talk about the older adult. We also talk about a lot of people who came to the event were mm -hmm. had older parents or mm -hmm. were caring mm -hmm. for a spouse. And so we can also be thinking about designing products that help increase the mobility of someone via the caregiver. I mean, we, there's gate belts. There's all mm -hmm. these different tools to help how can we think of even better ways that the caregiver mm -hmm. can help empower the, mm -hmm. the end user? All right, and this is Ellen, right? Yes, I'm Ellen Burbrock, and I uh, have the good luck to have been born so that I was in my 50s when uh, Steve Jobs introduced the first computer and the, for personal use. And so I had the chance to get on the wagon of technology at an early stage, and I did that through Avenidas, the senior center, which had a computer learning center, which showed us uh, was the opportunity to learn, 
they did it with uh, the old-fashioned screens. They didn't have any computers at that time. But I took time off from work to cut down, cut out, and go and take these classes. And so I've been really part of that society ever since my 50s. And I have been active in Avenidas, both as a member of Avenidas and uh, uh, active with their computer learning center. And I've been a great advocate of public transportation. It was also in my 50s that I realized that I did not like to drive to San Francisco, mm -hmm. but I did like to go to the symphony. And so I decided that I was going to learn. I wasn't going to quit going to the symphony. I learned to master and I, the public transportation possibilities here in California. We're really very fortunate and even fortunate here in Palo Alto. It is an alternative as a way to do, and I think the major problems seniors have are transportation and communication there. And for me, the most important thing at my age is that I want to stay an active part of my community and a productive part. And one of the ways I'm doing it is that I've been uh, uh, selected by the city manager to be on a panel that is working on the long range plans for Palo Alto and they have to have a new comprehensive plan. This keeps me involved with all sorts of people in the community meeting once a month, and it's just uh, very, very satisfying. And I, I think the two things that are important are being involved and feeling that you're a part of it, the community, and also uh, never underestimate when you're designing things for seniors the importance of feeling uh, attractive, and active and a part of the community that uh, uh, vanity is a very, very strong motive. <clears throat> That's great. You know, I'm Frank. I'm Frank Sabella and I've worked in businesses uh, for about 30 years and um, my interest stems just generally, I, I've always been interested in demographics of aging, but also from the standpoint that now I'm beginning to get older and, and for all you young people it actually does happen. Um, <laughs> you begin to start to notice these things, these subtle changes, and you begin to start thinking about, you know, can you really go up and down the stairs? Is there something you have to think about? So, um, and, and, but, but I'm really here because I want to make sure that you not only design mobility products, but something to make sure that I can keep all my hair in about 30 years too, so. <laughs> but <laughs> but, um, but I, I would say that, that really that the interesting thing about getting older is the, is and you touched on this, is the community, the perception of old people in the community. And uh, as I mentioned last week, when you look in, at advertisements and various other forms of media, and, and you can see, it, you begin to notice as you get older that you're not there. Okay, so part of the design thinking is, and, and is to make sure that you recognize that seniors want to be in the community, they want to participate, they want to keep doing what they're doing. If you ask me what I want, I want to be able to do what I do today in 30 years, in 40 years. So you need to keep that in mind when you think about your products, that we are not just sort of shunted off in some corner somewhere. And uh, as, as you said, we want things that look good and are cool and, and uh, make us feel like we're still participating members of society. It reminds me a little bit of what Laura said about, you know, it's so much about just the negatives. And I think remembering here in the design challenge, we want to, how can we promote the positives, help people do more of what they want to do, more of the fun stuff, you know, whether it's the chair cheerleading. I think a lot of products we see for older adults are very deficit oriented. Um, and how can we start to turn it around to what's the asset we're trying to maximize um, as someone gets older. And then we're very lucky to have Kevin here with us today. And Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about your story and kind of why you're here and what you're talking about today? Sure. Is my mic on? Uh, so I'm here as a representative of the uh, Davis Finney Foundation, and I'm actually curious because they're a sponsor. Do, do, does anyone here know who Davis Finney is and what his, his, his group represents? Clearly you do. So Davis Finney is uh, the epitome of what mobility is and when, when mobility is stolen from you. He has Parkinson's disease. He's an Olympic bike rider who has now made his mission and his foundation's mission how to deal with, with, with life without mobility 
and to celebrate every day that you can get it back. I am a Parkinson's patient. Uh, before I had the same surgery and lost my hair because of brain surgery, uh, I had a full head of hair. And I never dreamed that I would have ever had this disease of what I thought was for older people. And, but what was ironic on here is that once it was stolen away, and you had seen me before surgery, and this is what controls my surgery, is a, is, is a high-tech device where electrodes are placed in your brain, and through stimulation, I now am totally normal and I'm disease-free. If you hit this clicker off, I, I look like I have a stroke on my left side in there. So it's the epitome of what technology and in innovation can be on the high side. Now, vanity and all these other things are so true, and, and, and the point on here on, you know, I, li I like to wear 501 jeans. And when I wear 501 jeans and I'm not clicked on or I'm not on my medication, I can't button them. So imagine your kids coming up to you and say, Dad, your fly's down again, right? Well, that's the life that you live, low tech. So there's a version of everything that comes you know, in, in, you know, in, in between all of that. Um, I guess the way I look at it is I'm not as worried about losing mobility or the danger of a fall. I more worry at this age of my period of entering into the aging world is I don't want to be robbed of the chance to fall. So I don't want to be told that, you know, don't do this, Kim, don't ski, don't bike. You know, I don't want to be made irrelevant earlier before my time. And frankly, I think as we all age, today's generation that ages wants to be active. Mm -hmm. So for me, my question, my concerns are, how do I sustain that life for the next 20 years? How do I compress the morbid events so that now that I'm getting a peek of what you know, aging has already been early in my life, how can I help others get there? So that's my story. Wow, powerful. So I think we want to take this chance to open up to some questions that you all may have. You know, again, this idea of what, are we, what can we learn from people? Um, and I think we have a lot of wisdom here. And I think another point that you guys exhibit so nicely is off, too often we bucket older adults. You know, and we don't segment, we don't, we just talk about this age and over. And I don't know any, any of you in the room who buy products because you're 42 or because you know, you're 22. You buy a product because you have a need and you buy a product because you want to buy the benefits that that product delivers. And so I think we need to remember that that doesn't change with age. And so this group, you know, there's a lot of diversity up here and as you think about potential design opportunities, you really need to segment in and focus on a unique need and a unique customer. Any questions for the group? If not, I have one. Okay, Ken has one. So I want to follow up on your comment about uh, being in your 50s when the personal computer was introduced because um, oftentimes when I'll talk to people about aging and technology, they'll talk about the uh, technophobia of, of older people. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder whether you feel any different about technology or is it just a generational thing that for people that didn't experience it when they were younger, they aren't comfortable with it when they're older, but now that you have experienced it, it's just life. So does anybody have any thoughts about, in general, technology use by older people and how it's viewed by the rest of the public? Well, I think the uh, perception is that what older people want to do is to be able to email their grandchildren. <laughs> and that's the limit of what <laughs> they think will be uh, suitable for an activity if you are uh, uh, of that age. And actually, that's true of most of them. That is the entry point where they communicate. So it's the communication problem, and it is a eureka experience for them all when they learn how to Google, and they have a question, and they can find out things that they would not be a part of at all. So they can ask it questions. So. Yes, it's a great handicap not to have been a part of your life until you're in the older ages. And they have, my generation also was at the stage where they were alarmed for the young people going into it and keeping them off Facebook and, and, and just really frightened about the uh, effect that it would have on the younger people there. And to try and convince older people to keep their, uh, to be on Facebook or try it or LinkedIn for any reason, 
is very, very uphill battle. But the entry level is, I want to talk and I want to see pictures. I want to be in touch. There's also the um, importance of habit. Uh, we ignore that quite often. Uh, you know, older people have learned habits over 30, 40 years, whatever they are. I was watching people coming in at the beginning uh, here, and more or less, I'm generalizing a little bit, the older people were walking in with a piece of paper for their admission, and the younger people were flashing their phones. And, and that's a habit issue, yeah. And, and it has to be changed, and it's not easy to change habits. It, you, ha you have to be very motivated to change uh, some established habits of that sort. It would be interesting to see how older people use the new Apple uh, credit card, so to speak, you know, how long it will take them to make that transition. Younger people will do it right away. And so there is that to be changed. Habit is very powerful. I think both of those two comments in conjunction are really interesting, right? What's the motivation? What's the entry point? And then what, the how do you create habit. new habits? Mm -hmm. and I think that's a lot of what we need to be thinking about, especially on the physical activity part of this challenge. Is there another comment? Yeah, I was just going to say that it's part of the lifelong learning that, oh, that uh, students are learning now. And, and people who work for companies are sent back to school all the time to learn the new technologies and things like that. And, and we were not brought up in that generation, but if you're talking about emailing your grandchildren and then your grandchildren say, I don't read emails anymore. If you want to get in touch with me, you better text me or Twitter me. So you have to keep evolving, you know, Indeed. as they are. And, uh, and I think, you know, they are very much more used to it. And uh, there's a gap there with us, you know, but we've got to catch up or stay up. Well, um, well, I would say it's also an issue of relevance because <laughs> when you think about your designs, <laughs> it should be easy to use, right? And you, you know you've seen, I've grown up with computer technology and, and I was a software product manager at one point and everything, we always said it's easy to use, right? And we know it's almost never easy to use. And so when you think about your designs, you really have to consider how can, how can someone who's older get the benefit of that product mm -hmm. without having to you know, use multiple menus and, and, and if it's too small, I mean the iWatch and so on, I don't really know, but it's, it's part of what you have to think about. Um, and, and also it's a, it's a question of feeling relevant. I had a, at one point I had a gentleman who was about 70 working for me in, a, in, a, in an internet company full of kids. And he, he was respected as the old man, but he, he, the perception was that he just couldn't figure anything out. Okay. And he, he was actually pretty good. So I think that sometimes people have a, have a hesitancy to try to use new things and try them because they feel like maybe you know, they won't be able to do it. And there's a sense of embarrassment too. So, so I think the designs have to include real ease of use uh, when, when you create this product. I think you're highlighting you know, the point of the use of the word design. You know, this isn't just a solution challenge. This design is really critical here and design thinking and really understanding the need is critical. And I think so much of the usability challenges that we see is because of poor design. You know, it's not the user, it's the design that's failing the user's needs. And if you guys saw um, the company you presented here last year at the kickoff, Lift Labs, and their spoon, it's actually for people with um, Parkinson's and essential tremor. Um, and it helps negate tremors in the hand and helps people eat independently. And but it's such a great example of beautiful design. There's not even an on button. You just pick it up and it does what it's doing to help you. And so I think those are the kind of designs we're looking for where the technology falls into the background and the design just really takes it to a new place for someone's independence or empowerment. Were you gonna say something? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm an early innovator and I was one of the first people in my company to go to the iPhone from a Blackberry, which should now be in a tech museum. Um, <laughs> but I started noticing as I was, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, an abuser of texting. You know, I text all my colleagues early on. I, you know, I text my kids and all. And then what I found out was that after a while with Parkinson's, I couldn't text anymore. Mm. So thank God for voice recognition and Siri, because now I can voice dictate just as fast as my kids can text back, <laughs> maybe even faster. So I think that it's not only uh, innovation, but it's all, you know, it, it, thinking about innovation, it's, it's, it's how do you get people to adopt it? And giving the user manuals for a different generation that may not have the same, 
dexterity. And, and so, because these innovations should not be, you know, this is for young, this is for old. It's how do we get them to use it? And I think that's a really big part of it, mm -hmm. of, 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 ado of adoption. Ageless design. And right. one of the things we say a lot is, if you only test it with 22-year-olds, you're never going to know if it works for 82-year-olds. But if it works for 82-year-olds, it's probably going to work for the 22-year-olds as well. So I think we just got to flip it on its head and involve older adults and end users in the design process. And so that's why we're really trying to focus on the human-centered design approach. Mm -hmm. I just want to say I really appreciate the comment to focus on your assets versus on the deficits. And if you look at senior product advertising all over, it shows seniors as these disabled people. <laughs> and I know that if I was a senior, I would not like that. And the comment, too, about disappearing from ads and from pub the public eye, that's something I never thought of. And I have to say, this is the most wonderfully vital panel of seniors I've seen. And I'm so grateful to hear from all of you. Thank you so much. Um, I have a 72-year-old father who, with my mom, has 72, oh, sorry, 24,000 followers on um, social media. And <laughs> they did that in a year. I'm curious to know, um, when you think about socializing, I know that there was an emphasis more on um, in-person socializing, which totally makes sense. But would there be anything that you all could think of that would be more, more motivating to be on social media beyond sharing pictures of family and friends on Facebook? Is there anything that you think might actually be really cool that that's not out there yet for social media or socializing? Well, I would say it would be important to learn to use a smartphone. Because if you cannot set up dates and times and communicate easily, you get dropped from people's loops. It's too much trouble to try to light up their meetings or to include you in a session when you don't know if everybody will arrive on time at a particular restaurant across town. And so you just exclude them. So I would push myself and everybody else. I, I have a smart enough phone, but it's not smart enough <laughs> there. I think, is your question a little bit about, um, I know one of the things we've talked about is how do you kind of continue to replenish your social circle? And you know, we all go to college, you meet a bunch of new friends when you're in your freshman year of college, you have a baby, you meet a bunch of other you know, families. Like, are there, do you feel that in later life there's these, how can we help people make new friends in later life and could social media perhaps bring new people into our lives? Particularly those who don't have their family living nearby. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you guys know of any ways? I mean, you joined Avenidas, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Has anybody used technology to meet new people, um, in, perhaps in the sure. Parkinson's I mean, community? Look, right? I joined Aging 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> and now we're friends. Yeah, I, I meet all these people. Yes. Oh. So it is about putting yourself out there. And how did you find out about Aging 2.0 through Avenidas, right? Well, I, somebody emailed me a, yeah. about it, and it sounded like an interesting meeting. And so I was here on your first kickoff, I, I, you see. And uh, so if you have interest, then you have to figure out how will I get there and how will I do it. Mm -hmm. Do you want to start connecting with other people in the Parkinson's community? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've created a lot of my own mini groups, you know, and, you know, one example is I've, I, I'm a very irreverent guy, so I apologize for the irreverence on here because I want to fight getting, you know, aging in a, in a negative way, uh, in there, and I think it's good for the mind. But so I created a, a club called the Friends of Ke Kevin Ski Club, otherwise known as the FOKN Ski Club, right? <laughs> we'll figure out how to, how to pronounce that. But it created, it started off with 10 individuals, 10 friends. It was a company event. I invited friends to go skiing. And it's grown to maybe 50, 60 different people. And we just text each other amongst our own sort of network in there. So <clears throat> I guess for me, we can create our own networks. You know, it doesn't have to be someone else creating it for you. The, the tools are there to create our own. It's just a matter of taking advantage of all of those. 
I like your point though about irreverence. I think sometimes we do all this stuff in the senior space and we make it all so like paternalistic and here's right. here you go for this sweet little thing. <laughs> and you know, maybe it needs to be some FN transportation exactly. group that gets themselves around Palo Alto. You know, I think um, to not put not put the baby gloves on um, and really talk to real users about what they need and how they want to be talked to and how we can position products that will actually be things that people want. It's, it's, it's what Frank talked about being relevant and yeah. still maintaining relevance as, as, as we mature, not age. <laughs> no, but it's a good question. I, I don't have an answer to it, but I think um, if you can develop an application that is easy to use and can allow people to create these networks, I mean, something like meetups, and sites like that where you can create your own groups and they can populate and so on. In, so, in some sense, I guess, my, my daughter is 17 and, and she says the teenagers are no longer into Facebook, so it's kind of like Facebook is becoming, <laughs> Facebook is becoming Facebook for seniors now, so it's, it's, uh, it's, but it's. Well, we probably have time for like one more question, how about right here? Yeah. Um, okay. I know. Sorry. We've been talking about things and gadgets and uh, software, and I'd like to expand this to a much greater plane. Um, early on, there was a discussion about how people need to accommodate to their environments, uh, the greater environments. And in the 50s, when we had this triangle <coughs> picture um, and lots of kids and cars and post-war, we, we redesigned our communities to have big highways and cul-de-sacs and um, communities that didn't have sidewalks and zoning that had retail all in one place. I'd like to hear what your ideas might be on addressing, redesigning our cities. Do you have some thoughts? Well, uh, I'm not so ambitious to think of redesigning our cities, but one uh, story I read, and I think it's being repeated in a lot of places, but this one happened uh, in the Beacon uh, Hill uh, community of Boston where the people on one street, on one long street, decided to make themselves into a village. So they are all now part of a little village of a community. And I find that idea, that whole uh, way of going, extremely appealing because there is physical proximity. There's, it's very easy to see the neighbors all the time. You don't have to depend on a son or daughter who lives 30 miles away if there is an emergency. Uh, so I find that direction, uh, wherever we are, whether we're in the suburbs or in the center of a big city, it's, it shouldn't be too hard to start the little village, mm -hmm. wh wherever we are. In the Village of People, our institute, there's now a village-to-village -village network, and these are being set up all around the country. And I know Chris Kennedy's here, this whole um, age-friendly cities movement is something that's going on in a number of cities, and they talk about like, seven or eight different pillars of eight eight pillars of like what makes an age-friendly community. So there is some stuff happening, and Chris is organizing events next, later this month, um, a week from today, and I'm speaking at it. And <laughs> of course my slides are done. Um, and, but I, I'm thinking about age-friendly Silicon Valley. And so there are initiatives thinking about how do we reshape cities. Um, and it's great to point out that we've done it before. We can do it again. We have new dynamics um, that we're working at. So Ken said we have a couple more minutes to take a couple more questions. We have one back here. Okay. Davis. Hi, Katie. Um, I'd like to start off by just thanking all of you for being a part of this process. I think all too often, which is the whole point of having you up there, um, we don't really hear from you and, and get your feedback and input, so I, I really appreciate your, your being a part of it. Um, we're, we're, really, we're in this really exciting moment in this convergence of technology and this really terrific explosion of, of folks who are um, who are really needing like new solutions to, to aging, um, and but but a really key part of this this technology this huge transformation in, in technology and innovation is in the collection of data and you know everything from where you go and where you eat and you know, how many times you go to the bathroom every night and you know all this data is also is what's enabling um, people to innovate and come up with these brand new solutions and approaches to solving problems and so my question was like what what is your what do you feel about how do you feel about um, the collection of all this personal information and uh, does it does it worry you does it concern you and at one point at what point does it uh, feel like you're giving so much of yourself away that you're really not yourself any longer 
Anybody have any thoughts about data collection? Kevin? Oh, <clears throat> I think there's initially a phobia, and then if you embrace it, you get over that phobia. You know, for, I'm, I'm, I'm on a clinical trial now with my neurotransmitter that, it's called the brain radio. So not only does it give me therapeutic benefit, once a month I go in, into, the, into Stanford Hospital and they download a month load of brain data, brain radio and, and brain mapping. It's part of the initiative of, of, of the Obama brain initiative to try to brain map. Now initially my kids thought that that was really kind of exposing too much and they said, Dad, your perverse thoughts are now being shown to Congress, right? <laughs> But again, I think it's, it's every individual has, has to find their own time and place you know, to be able to contribute to, to something. But again, 23andMe is another great example of giving genetic information. And so I think we are in a, in a world where, where data is eventually going to come out. And we can either fight it or we can embrace it. And so I guess I've chosen in my world to do it now instead of later. And everyone will have to find their own time for that. right? But I think we can benefit more if we do it sooner than later. It's, it's to your point, it's a great time mm -hmm. to, to have disease. It's a great time to get old. <laughs> well, I, I don't think it's been, I, in some sense, I don't think it's that different. I mean, if you go before all the data collection, I, I would say that most of us didn't have that much privacy anyway. I mean, you right. can go down to the city hall and find out who's, who's on the beat of your house. There's, at, at one point, I was working with a company that did claims investigation, and these, these investigators could find out all kinds of stuff on people without all of the massive data mining. So, um, I, I view it as a service, really. I think um, as, as long as the data that's being mined uh, can come back and be used by me or by all of you in some productive way, it doesn't really bother me. You learn to ignore all the, the custom ads coming at you all the time, but um, I, I don't feel that it's a problem as long as it's not abused and, it's, and it provides constructive information. Do you guys, do you three agree with what Frank's saying? Yes. Yeah. There, there has to be something that I'm getting out of it. Yeah, it's about you know, it's, it's, it can't be constantly, I give the data, I tell them about me, you know, but at some point, and one of the things that's not exploited enough is people, uh, I've seen this in many people who, who, who say, oh, I didn't know other people had this problem. And just that, you know, being able to say, oh, you have the following problem. Do you know that 150,000 other people suffer from the same thing or have questioned us about that? Just knowing that is already quite a bit of return on whatever data I'm providing. But there has to be some, something I get in return uh, soon, soon, okay. not later. <laughs> you just gave me an idea about you know, data, and you were talking about social networks, and we're talking about how can we get people more active and connecting more socially. Well, what if we had a bunch of older adults wearing Fitbits, and we could suddenly tell you, did you know you walk the same pace as this person, mm -hmm. and this walking group could form around the 12-minute mile versus mm -hmm. the 14-minute mile, because a lot of people might not want to go to a walking group if they're afraid they're going to be the slowest person. So mm -hmm. you know, how can we kind of start to tie these different ideas together? Um, that adds social, it adds data that gives her a benefit she wants um, that's really meaningful and small data in the moment. I think there's this thing called an ethics check. Right, so if, I think if we, as long as we're applying ethics, you know, to the innovation and data, then I think it's the same idea that you said. People have always had it. Maybe we had ethics governing it, but to me, that's where that's where it's okay to do that. Well, Google, do no evil. Well, on that note, we will do no evil, and we will hope that the um, designers in the room today and the ones who are hopefully later watching this video all around the world and understanding the kickoff of this challenge will you know, be inspired to think about new ways to apply technology to help people stay, enable personal mobility. And with that, Ken, have any closing thoughts? Or? Uh, I'd just like to thank the panel to start with. Thank you, thank you, thank you.